And that's why I think it's exciting to travel to different parts of El Salvador, because if you're just in the main city, you don't really get to experience sort of the authentic El Salvador. You get different cities and villages have different vibes and you get to find like these little stories that you want to tell other people like oh you know we were driving down this like crazy road to get to Tamanique super you know like super windy and then in the little village you know they're drying coffee on the street and there's chickens running around everywhere <laughs> as you learn you start to connect the dots and things kind of tie in so for example my family we escaped communism in Poland when I was really small but it was a tiny car and all our belongings were there right that's all we could take to escape and we became refugees in Germany so you know there's a little bit of that story and understanding like sometimes you do have to leave your yeah. country because the circumstances aren't ideal and so you know there's a part of that story that makes me understand that too right and generational you know assets and passing them on We are live from Bitcoin Beach with Megs Granoska. Welcome. I'm um, excited to hear about how your week in El Salvador has been, what you think of the uh, Bitcoin economy here in El Salvador, and then also dive into a little bit about your experience in using waste to, to mine Bitcoin. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited and so sad that I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> a week is not long enough. I no. mean, you got to do at least... I mean, you can change your ticket. I mean, it, it, it is notorious for people coming, specifically when they come to El Zante, that they plan on being here for a few days and then a few months later, yes. they're still here. So. <laughs> I do intend to come back. So what is, uh, what's been your experience here in El Salvador? What, I, I think even before that, what was your kind of your preconceived notions ahead of time? What did you think you would find? What were you expecting? And how has that been different or matched what your expectations were? I think I've had so I know a lot of Bitcoiners are like, oh, everybody accepts, Bit accepts Bitcoin and this is what I'm expecting. And I've read some stories and I understand that it takes some time for the population to get used to it. And um, so I wasn't like I was coming into it as humble, like as I'm a not, realist, as a realist. I like I'm, I'm not going to force the locals if they're if they're not used to Bitcoin, because I spent most of my time in San Salvador. Um, not Bitcoin Beach. Like here, I was super excited. Today, I went for a walk on the beach and I bought a coconut using Bitcoin, right? And that to me was like, this is how it should be. I don't have to worry about carrying around cash. I yeah. can just quickly, you know, take out my wallet. And, and that's, that's, that's kind of the experience that I think everyone expects. Um, but in other places, you know, if you want to tip somebody or, or give them money, some places I might not have even internet reception, right? like at the top of the volcano. So you can't pay for your ice cream at the top of the volcano or some fruit. Um, and, and if they don't have a, a, a Bitcoin wallet, um, I think it's kind of awkward to force them because it, this is still a very much a cash economy. So yeah. by forcing them to accept what you want, that's maybe not ideal. They don't know what to do with it. It's less valuable. So I think anyone that's coming here, I really like Walker's approach from the crypto couple where he's like, OK, I'll tip you some money. But if you want more money, I will tip you in Bitcoin. So like, you don't so worry. So they have the choice. Exactly. Yeah. So you're going to get this tip. Yeah. But I'm also going to gift you some more. And I think that's a great approach because you're not making it awkward and you're not coming in like, I know better, right? Yeah. And so, so I think that, you know, Bitcoiners that come in and expecting to pay for everything, <laughs> That's not how it works. And it was great because I got to spend some time, too, with Bitcoiners that have moved here. And they were telling me their experiences, some things they are able to pay. Um, for example, their landlord is not yet accepting Bitcoin. So, you know, that that part, it's it's a typical expense. But, you know, there's some supermarkets that accept it. This is, again, in South yeah, San Salvador. Yeah. So it was really interesting to hear what you can and what you can't. But, for example, all their uh, bills they can pay with Bitcoin. So it was really interesting getting the experiences and, you know, understanding there's still some frictions, maybe not. So Chivo, for example, like the Chivo wallets that are mobile, you can pay on the Lightning Network. So 
but it's you know you have to go through a couple of steps so you know just learning and sometimes about that. this the employee won't know or yes. is afraid like no i'm only gonna do the chivo dollar thing yeah. and you're like yeah. No, you can do it there. They're like, no, no, no. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's different. And and even like when I first came to El Salvador, like landed and I saw the big sign, you know, welcome to Land of Volcanoes and, you know, welcome to El Zante Surf City. Uh, and I saw the sign. It's like pay in Bitcoin for your visa. And I was like, yes, I'm going to pay in Bitcoin. And I whip out my phone and I say, you know, hey, I'm going to pay in Bitcoin. She's starting to get it ready. And then I'm like, I have no internet. <laughs> I can't pay with Bitcoin. So a tip to anyone coming in, you can get something like an eSIM card to so that you're like put it into your phone before you arrives. If you're really keen to pay in Bitcoin, you can. <laughs> so it's just like these yeah. little tips and, and understanding sort of the limitations um, that will make your trip a little smoother. No, that's I hadn't thought about that of people, you know, in the airport not even having any cell service. So yeah, yeah that's a yeah. good but I think, too, is like a lot of Bitcoiners, I know they're so excited and they want to come to El Zante specifically because it's Bitcoin Beach and yeah. maybe they spend a lot of time here. But I had the opportunity to go to a few different places and it's just the diversity of, you know, experiences you can have. So I hiked two different volcanoes and it's which like volcanoes did you go? So I did the um, San Salvador volcano, which is really close to the city. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I did Santa Ana volcano, okay. which is incredible. Is that where you got the ice cream at the top? There is ice cream, but I didn't realize there would be ice cream at the top. Well, the so guy, I had no the money or carried, reception. The guy carries <laughs> it all the way from the bottom in this cooler. Yeah. I mean, it's like a few hour walk yeah. and walks up with the yeah. group so you can buy your ice cream. Yeah. I mean, it's so a, it's a tip. Yeah. You have some change right yeah. when you go to the top of the Santa Ana volcano, which is just so awesome. Um, no, it's beautiful. It's amazing. And it's the thing, too, I love about here is you get to actually experience things in the U.S. They'd have it all roped off and you wouldn't yeah. be able to get close here. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm close to the edge there. Yeah. But it's you get yeah. to experience the whole thing. Here's another thing that, that I want to mention. So for those that have not been to more developing countries, there's a lot of street dogs. Um, and I learned this when I went to Peru. So I, I kind of always snuck a little bit from my breakfast. And I know maybe it sounds silly, but I would like carry it around and like, oh, here's a street dog. Here's a street dog. So there are dogs at the top of this volcano and, and everywhere. At the top. Right at the top. I know there was two. So I think maybe some sometimes people feed them and they go up and follow. Same thing happens in Machu Picchu. They track for like four days with people. Really? I know because they keep giving them food. So they're like, oh, we're going to go. And then they all get stuck at Machu Picchu because they don't know how to get back. But anyways, if you're a dog lover, sneak some treats and there's dogs everywhere and they're most of the time super friendly. <laughs> when were you in Peru? Um, I went last year, okay. so about a year okay. ago. Yeah, We were just there uh, a few weeks ago yeah. with uh, working with some Bitcoin projects there. Amazing. And so it was, yeah, a lot of street dogs. There. And it's very similar to, I find, like the people in both Peru and in El Salvador, they're so friendly. They'll say yeah. hello to you. They want to talk to you. Um, and honestly, they would give you like the shirt off your back and they're so very giving. And I love that. And that's why I think it's exciting to travel to different parts of El Salvador, because if you're just in the main city, you don't really get to experience sort of the authentic El Salvador. Whereas if you're walking through like the village, um, here or um, T Tamanique. Tamanique? Yeah. Tamanique? Yeah. Yeah. It's just you get different cities and villages have different vibes and you get to find like cool and so many things. different climates too. Yeah. Like you can go yeah. from the mountains to the tropical heat of the beaches to yeah. the highland plains of San Salvador and it's yeah. And, and it is. And then you'll find like these little stories that you want to tell other people like, oh, you know, we were driving down this like crazy road to get to Tamanique, super, you know, like super windy. And then in the little village, you know, they're drying coffee on the street and there's chickens running around everywhere. <laughs> is that where you went? Did you go to the waterfall there? In I, did, I went to the waterfall okay. and That's that a, is it's a pretty amazing one there. I highly recommend there was at least four waterfalls, okay. different heights. And you can if, if you're not not scared, <laughs> you can jump into the water from from the heights. Uh, and it's like if you visit during the dry season, it's quite hot. So this is yeah, a perfect super refreshing. place to cool off. <laughs> Amazing. Highly recommend. So that's why I wanted to. And, and a lot of these places, like none of these places I really plan to visit other than Bitcoin Beach when I came here. And it was discussions with um, other tourists, with the locals of like, what are some of the top places that I can go that are maybe within an hour? 
hour and a half, depending yeah. on traffic from the city or from uh, El, El Zante that you can get to, that you can kind of experience this diversity of um, climates. <laughs> Did you make it to the east of the country at all, to the beaches there? On uh, the no, so I only went to El Junco. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I did two beaches. Well, actually, I think I did quite a lot within the week. Oh, yeah. Right? No, no. For, <laughs> for a short trip to hit two volcanoes, a couple waterfalls, uh, yeah. San Salvador, a couple beaches, You. it sounds like you were busy. Yeah. And, and I hope, too, that, like, you know, I share some pictures, share some experiences, and I hope that other Bitcoiners are inspired because maybe they're like, ah, oh, it's a beach. It's great. Like, you know, they accept Bitcoin. But but now it's like, well, you've got beaches, you've got waterfalls, you've got volcanoes. So there's there's a, a yeah. lot to experience. here. No, I love the coffee country here. I mean, I live at the beach. I like to surf. But quite frankly, sometimes the heat gets a little too much. And I'd like yeah. to go to like cool coffee country. You have yeah. like the cloud forest areas. Yeah. And it's it's and literally in 40 minutes, you can be from here to like the high, you know, 5,000 feet elevation where it's cool. Yeah. And so yeah, it nowhere was, else you can really do that in that short of a distance. And, yeah. and I know another thing that people ask about is safety. And so this was kind of funny because literally two minutes before I was asking my guide, um, you know, do people ever come and try to rob you on these trails, right? Like, is it dangerous? And then two policemen. <laughs> came out the slope at that exact moment. I, I, I jest, I'm like, they're making sure that you're not, you know, plugging your miner directly into the volcano here. But um, I felt pretty safe. And um, I think my parents were quite worried when I came here. And some other countries too, I don't think they've updated their uh, advisories. Like Canada, if you go El Salvador, it's, you know, it's quite dangerous. Yeah basically don't go. Um, and so then the parents worry. So they're always like, OK, I'm good. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. So I think there's some political motivation uh, uh, on why they keep those travel advisories. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you yeah. read that and you think you're going to get shot coming out of the airport and you, people come here, they're like, this is totally different than I was expecting. I didn't yeah. feel in danger at yeah. all. And so this was uh, El Tsu Tunco, and uh -huh. it was neat because I met two Canadians there. They live in uh, London, Ontario, and they were telling me a story how her husband was originally from here. He lived here until he was five, and then he hadn't been back for 45 years because they thought it was too dangerous. So I actually tr you know, made this effort to talk to so many people um, to kind of get their experience. You know, is this the first time visiting? And when was the last time you were here? So that was like the longest time. And he was telling me how when he was young, he remembered going to this little pupasa place. Uh, pupusa place and he would you know they would actually give him some free ones because they, they felt like oh yeah here you go you know gen they were generous and he actually visited the same place and really he, yeah and he went and he ate food there and he thanked them so it was kind of a neat story and there were quite a lot of canadians americans that i met um that that had lived here long ago they had family and they hadn't seen them in 10 years and 15 years um, some of them didn't feel safe because they had tattoos and, the, you know, the gangs yeah. had tattoos, so they didn't think it was safe to come back. And just hearing these stories was really amazing. And then also another lady from the U.S., her family used to own a few houses here and they were basically deemed worthless because people were just afraid. Like nobody even wanted to live there because yeah. it was so dangerous because of the gangs. And she just sold her last one. And so it's like, you know, the economy is starting up again. People feel safer. Talking to the cab drivers is actually really good because they see a lot. You know, they see new construction coming up. Um, they have a good feel and vibe. And, you know, just every time I was kind of asking them and, you know, typical stories. Yes, I do feel safer. Like, look, the people are smiling. You know, their, their businesses are open. And also just, you know, I know there was, for example, those pictures of all the gangs getting locked up that, you know, there were human rights concerns about that. But at the same time, getting people's stories about how horrible life was here, how people were getting murdered. There's quite a lot of atrocities that happened and they're kind of, you know, a lot, I think almost all but one person. And he, he wasn't even like unsupportive of yeah. government. He's just like, you know, it's not. It's not bad. Like it wasn't like, yes, I support. Um, so they're quite supportive because they like there's a big change in how people are able to live their lives now. And I think that 
you know, it's a fundamental kind of right to feel safe in your country. And so so they're quite happy that that that's changed. And now we're getting to the point where they're getting a lot of tourists. Yeah. So I think it's awesome. And and, you know, how I hope hopefully more of us will come. <laughs> well, we we bought our house here, I think, 19 years ago. And for the first 10 years, when I would talk to Salvadorans in the U.S., they would look at me aghast, like, why would you ever go there? I would never go there. It's too yeah. dangerous. But I have noticed in the last few years that's totally changed. They're, they're all like, oh, I want to buy something there. I'm planning yeah. on going or I went last year. And so for me, it's been really heartwarming to see this real shift in Salvadorans. That, yeah. And you see that every time you're on a plane, you start start up conversations with people and tons of times they're like, yeah, I haven't, like you were saying, I haven't been here in 10 years, yeah. but I'm coming back to visit family. Or yeah. I've talked to some real estate people. They said, really what's driving the market right now is people, Salvadorans from the US coming back and buying yeah. properties to retire or to start up businesses or just to come back to El Salvador because they feel like there's more opportunities here. So well, it's even- a lot of fun. Even the businesses, like I heard a couple of times from the cab drivers, well, you know, that the gangs used to like give me 70 percent or 100 percent of your take today. And it's like, what is the point of having a business if all your income just keeps being taken so that there is no hope? And yeah. now they have hope. So I think it's amazing. No, they used to. A lot of times businesses would shut down and you ask them. They're like, it wasn't worth it after I yeah. paid the, the renta is what they would call it, mm. the rent. And and so that has really shifted and it and i think a lot of people initially were were skeptical was there really going to be change because there's been governments prior governments that have tried to crack down but yeah people have had to still keep paying through that and even a lot of times when they would do the crackdowns the extortion would continue Uh, and so for me it was made real when the guy that we used for our airport runs told me yeah, this is for the first time in 15 years that we stopped paying. And so wow. you really do see a shift. And and I share the same concerns, the, the human rights concerns. And there, anytime you have a major roundup, there's going to be innocent people that, that get yeah. caught up. And obviously, those people's lives are very important. They have families, they're people's you know, sons or husbands. And so... You know, I don't want to minimize what's happening, but it's it's kind of like a war setting. Like you have to make decisions yeah. on both sides that where there's going to be consequences. And I think for most Salvadorans, they feel like the lesser of the evils is to maybe err on the side of being more aggressive in the lockup. And we'll, we'll see. We'll yeah. see longer term how, yeah. it, how it turns out. But for right now, there really is a, a shift in sentiment. Like people are very excited and very positive about the country. And a lot of them that before had plans to leave for the U.S. are kind of shifting their plans and thinking, no, I want to make a life here. Yeah. That's pretty remarkable. So it's, it's interesting to hear you saying that you had those conversations and that's what you were hearing. Yeah, and here. I think I was making an effort to make sure I had those conversations to any kind of tourist. I ran into the elevator. It was always like, where are you from? Are you visiting for business? Are you visiting family? And then, oh, how long has it been? And it was most of the time was actually it's been a long time yeah. since I've seen my family. So it's it's really cool. Awesome. So give us a little bit of a, a history on how you got into the Bitcoin space, <laughs> sure. why you wound up here in El Salvador, <laughs> you know, checking out um, what's happening here with the country and, and Bitcoin adoption. Um, when when did you jump down the rabbit hole? So I jumped into the rabbit hole 2017. And I'm part of the class of number go up. So, <laughs> ah, what is this thing? Yeah. Bitcoin. And then I invested some funds. And then, of course, you know, you start to continue like, oh, what's this Ethereum? I'll put some money in there. And then I bought ICOs because everybody was like, everybody was making money. And that's how I learned, you know, I lost a lot of money. Actually, I didn't get into the black until 2020 because I didn't just buy Bitcoin and I didn't know what I was buying. And in that time, you kind of learn. You're like, oh, wait, this is fundamentally different. This is a fraud. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of fraud out there. And and but you kind of, <laughs> you know, you touch the stove yeah. and you learn and, and it forces you. The other thing, too, is like there's quite a lot that. To understand Bitcoin, you have to understand so many different things. It's not like an instant understanding. You know, there's the complex energy system fits into Bitcoin, right? There's um, how what money is and, and how societies function. And there's governance and intermediaries. There's just 
so many. There's all pieces. the technical side just, of it. Yeah. yeah, and then there's the technical side, and it's just there's there's a lot. And I'm no expert, but you know, it it took some time yeah. to understand the fundamentals. But I think too, um, you know, family history. You know, everyone has their story, and their family has a story. So I think. Um, as you learn, you start to connect the dots and things kind of tie in. So, for example, my family, we escaped communism in Poland when I was really small. And all we, well, the government actually messed up. They gave all my family a passport. Instead, Usually they give one or two passports, but the whole family unit. So my parents are like, we're out of here. right? So they packed everything into the little Fiat car, like Fiat the brand, not <laughs> <laughs> Fiat. But it was a tiny car and all our belongings were there, right? That's all we could take to escape and we became refugees in Germany. So, you know, there's a little bit of that story and understanding, like sometimes you do have to leave your yeah. country because the circumstances aren't ideal. Um, my grandma had beautiful gardens, big, luscious, you know, uh, and, and also a house in Poland. But when the borders shifted after the war, her town, Tarnopol, became part of Ukraine. And it was confiscated by the government. It was no longer hers and they got kicked out. They had to go back to Poland. So that is an asset, you know, that's a legacy that you leave your family that just, you know, the whims of governments. Well, shifting you think real borders. estate's one thing that's like, no, it's that's not going to change. Stable. Yeah. Well, actually, yes, yeah. it did. I mean, I know it's rare, but it, yeah. it does happen. And so, you know, there's a part of that story that makes me understand that too, right? And generational, you know, assets and passing them on. Um, and then a third story that's kind of, you know, near and dear is my grandfather. His grandfather um, was an artist and he painted many paintings. And when, again, the war happened and all, you know, they locked up the house because they had to escape because it was dangerous. There was bombings and, and so forth. And when they came back, the door was smashed open and everything was gone. And, you know, months later, he was walking down the street um, and he came across like his grandfather's paintings and art galleries that were for sale. But there's no proof that this yeah. is yours, that it was stolen and he couldn't afford to buy them back. Um, I even looked <laughs> myself like when he told me the story a couple of years ago and uh, it were like a couple ten, tens of thousands, some of them. And it was like, well, I can't afford to buy them either. And that's a real shame. But again, it's like this asset that's your family's that got stolen. So, you know, these little stories that as you talk to your parents and your grandparents, you, you find parts about your family that maybe you think about a little differently now that you're a Bitcoiner. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Maybe in the next uh, run up in Bitcoin, uh, <laughs> maybe they'll be affordable <laughs> in Bitcoin price. <laughs> I think it would be special to have one. Yeah. yeah. No, to have something with that yeah. that family significance. Yeah. Um, but no, those. I mean, that makes it makes it felt at a different level when you realize how if family had had Bitcoin at those times, how yeah. it would have helped and how it would have lessened the hardship. Not totally yeah. taken it away. But yeah. But yeah, definitely lessen the hardship along the way. Yeah, so, so that that's makes a sense. how I got in yeah. and kind of family history. But um, so um, and I, then, you, then you also learn the importance of not your keys, not your coins, correct? I did. I did. <laughs> so I'm a Quadriga creditor and Quadriga was the biggest exchange failure in Canada. It was the craziest story. Basically, everything that could go wrong on an exchange went wrong. That's the I guy that that. Supposedly when, died in India and yes. people think he faked his death exactly. and all that. Okay. <laughs> so that's that one. I mean, it was the craziest story up until SBF, but it's interesting because SBF kind of like took pages from his book <laughs> and he did like <laughs> everything, <laughs> but like 10 or a hundred X. So, um, Gerald, he stole about $10 million worth and bought properties with it. Right. F SBF took, I don't know, $200 million and bought properties. Um, you know, things weren't tracked on the exchange. They was like just haphazard accounting. And so, um, Gerald took people's funds and he sent, you know, crypto to other exchanges and he traded with it. And he was a terrible trader, huge losses. SPF made investments, big yeah, losses, yeah. right? As Alameda. So it's just crazy how this continues every cycle. There's just like, it just gets bigger. Um, but yeah. And, and he wasn't like, there was really no accounting, right? Like, no, there, there was no nothing. And that hurt us as creditors. Yeah. So I'm a bankruptcy inspector appointed by the Supreme Court of Canada to represent creditors. There's, I'm one of five. Um, and so, you know, you get some insight, but you also oversee the bankruptcy, the trustee, you make decisions on, you know, that behalf. Um, but yeah, so, you know, 
that, that's how you kind of learn to self custody is you get burned. Um, and, and it's a shame. And is that still ongoing or it's is still that ongoing. all been wrapped up? So, okay. You don't want to get caught up in a bankruptcy because they take a long time. They're super yeah. complex. Like look at Mount Gox 2014. They still haven't gotten their no. money. Uh, 20 late 2018, 2019 is when the bankruptcy actually happened was for Quadriga. I'm hoping that we managed to get to distribution before Mount Gox. Um, but these cases and they get they do get more complex because I think SBF like there was even more crazy things, shenanigans happening there. And so it'll take a long time to unravel yeah. and people get their funds. And that's you know, that's what happens. You have to make sure that only put on the exchange what you're willing to lose. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's crazy because people think, eh, what are the chances of it exactly happening? like this cycle? They're like, oh no, we got rid of yeah, all the bad yeah. actors, and it's like the biggest bad actor. <laughs> the crazy thing with me, and and I don't know, I haven't you know dove too deeply into it, but and I don't know if it's true, but somebody said that they that um, they were using QuickBooks for their their books. I saw that. Yes, and I'm like. Eh? It, <laughs> How could that not be a red flag for mm -hmm. all the VCs and investors? Yeah. Was just everybody expecting somebody else was the one doing the due diligence? I think that's or what it came down to. But on the taxes, so Quadriga did not file any taxes and that hurt us. And it cost us two years in the process because the Canadian Revenue Agency said, huh, you owe us money. You haven't been paying, so we're owed. But then they're trying to figure out how much they're owed because he didn't keep books. Yeah. But also there was um, he created fake trade like he traded fake money against users. <laughs> so trying to figure out what was real versus what wasn't. So now they after two years, they came out. This is how much we are owed. We're also a creditor. And it's very frustrating, too, because it's like, well, there really is no exchange anymore. He's and Quadriga was losing money during that time. So how could they owe taxes exactly, on Exactly. And there's just creditors. Yeah, yeah. So but the government's like, we want our piece. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it, it really surprised me with FTX that because, you know, I never had any funds in FTX and I his political leanings, another thing. I always felt there was something off, but everybody thought, no, this is the yeah. one that's like the shining example of how to do things right. And then like, what was that based on? Like there was no, I mean, crazy, crazy things yeah. that you don't have to be a finance major to understand, yeah. like you need to have certain yeah. things in place. So. And I do think that like increasingly people are becoming a little bit more cautious. Like I think recently there was, you know, all the bank runs on the banks and people are like, I'm not even taking any chances, like taking yeah. my funds out. Um, but he really did kind of mess, uh, screw up for the industry for a lot of folks because Canadian regulators, U.S. regulators are becoming more uh, uh, stringent, yeah. which in some ways is good, but sometimes the policies aren't like a lot of times they're focused on the sense. wrong things and they just Ex make things difficult for the legitimate players. And exactly. So. But then also the banking issues. I know some some companies are getting debanked. Plus, with those other two banks falling like the Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate, yeah. I think those are going to harm our industry because Bitcoiners like probably they would have more likely accepted them um, as for, for banking services. So it does get more challenging. Yeah. And, and it's a shame because, you know, we want our businesses to succeed. They need banking to function if there's any kind of on and off ramp. So I really hope that um, our industry doesn't, you know, manages to continue to thrive. Yeah. No, I mean, I you know, obviously look at historically the things it's overcome. This is just one more thing that they'll talk about. And in the long run, I don't yeah. think it's going to hold back Bitcoin from its ultimate, you know, destination of where <laughs> where we think it's it's going. But, yeah. you know, it is kind of makes it rough along the way. Um, but it makes for some good stories, too. So that, the whole thing with FTX, you're like, I feel like he was trying to make this so it'd be a good movie because everything <laughs> he did was Infamous. so insane that like I know. if you made a movie up and put all those things in the movie people would be like no this nah, is unbelievable too crazy. Yeah. same thing with gerald so. cotton right the whole story of how he went to india it, yeah, and then he died, died and then they took his body from from the hospital to the hotel and then they brought it back and the hospital didn't want it. It's like, this isn't the right process. It's just so weird. But um, but he did lose a lot of money. So it's like if there was like the 200 million was yeah, gone, yeah. it could be somewhere. It's like, well, 
yeah, it's more probability he's alive, but the fact that he was a horrible traitor. But there's still a lot of funds unaccounted for, right? Yeah, yeah. So, well, some some were trading losses. So 140 million were trading losses. So I can't remember the numbers. It's been a while, maybe like 30 or 40 million. It's not as much as you would have expected okay. from the total amount. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's bad news. So, Sorry. so, and I don't know if you're in your position, if you're allowed to opine on it, but do you, do you think that he's dead or do you think oh, just he's alive? My, my, myself personally, like because uh, so the Ontario Securities Commission did a thorough analysis of where all the funds went. And because I saw, you know, as 140 million was losses, trading losses, another 30 million was <laughs> this saved us. So uh, CIBC, the bank, it locked 30 million of funds because it's like there's some funny shenanigans happening here. Like you're commingling your own funds with um, client funds, like we're locking this down and then uh, take they, they got taken to court to try to get it back. But because it was locked down, we had 30 million to recover. And then the 10 million was properties like, you know, you bought boats, planes, okay. autos. Was the 30 million in cash or was it in Bitcoin? Uh, no, it was cash. It was cash. Okay. Yeah, all the cryptos like traded off. Okay. Um, and so because we had like that 30 million, we had 10 million that we sold off, you know, properties and, and, and assets. You know, so that, kind of about 40 million was recovered. Okay. And so so it's not like there was this gig, like the majority of it, who knows where it went. Yeah. 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 So so what how many cents on the dollar will people probably recover? Um, if, between like 10 and 14 cents on the okay. dollar. Yeah. Yeah. But that's at the time of bankruptcy, right? Like, yeah. Assets have gone yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that was that was the the thing that Mt. Gox had going for it. It was, it was held in Bitcoin. And so yes. a lot yeah. of people will actually get more in dollar value than exactly. Yeah. And who knows too? Like I'm sure there would have been some people that would have sold along the way. So it's almost like they were yeah. <laughs> forced to No model. problem. For sure there are some people in Mount Gox that are better yeah. off because yeah. of they what might have happened, sold it. So. They're like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. This isn't for me. But I think too, and as um as there's more crypto just types of cryptos out there, Mt. Gox was simple. It was fiat and Bitcoin, right? So you could recover either yeah. or. Whereas now you have like some of these exchanges have like thousands of you know crypto that are available. So what ends up happening is they get sold, and then everybody receives cash. It's just like the common denominator. Yeah. And so. Um, and sometimes their markets are so no liquidity, and exactly. so when they sell it all yeah. off, it pushes the price down. Or so. they sell during a bull. Sorry, bear, which yeah. is like. Not so great. I think we actually sold closer to the bull market, so at least we were lucky what what assets we had. But if if you are getting distribution, it's nicer at least if you're getting it to the during the the bear. So at least if you want to reinvest, reinvest whatever it. Yeah. you get, it's painful if you get it during yeah. the bull market. So you had the experience with that, yeah. and then now I, I believe you're more focused on the mining yeah, space. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about sure. what you're doing in that space, sure. and then I want to dive into the energy side of it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I spent a decade in government, and I worked on transition to a low carbon economy, and a lot of it was working with heavy industry around how do we invest and stay competitive. and low carbon really comes down to energy like what kind of forms of energy are we using because that's where carbon emissions are coming from and on the other side too is working with the ministry of energy on energy pricing and and the the energy system within ontario so that kind of built up it's it's a natural fit you know heavy industry energy system mining is a good fit after spending some time in bitcoin because they are a type of heavy industry yeah. in terms of you know, they, they have a big um, their energy consumption, exactly yeah. the energy consumption. And given all the ESG stuff, you know, I understand I can talk the talk around it. And and I think I think mining is pretty special, too, because it's one it's the only industry really where you have a physical footprint, but also like a digital footprint. Right. So you you have physical infrastructure, you're using energy, but you produce a digital commodity. And, and I think that marrying those two it means you're both creating kind of like innovation based jobs um and and part of that economy it fits into that but also into so many sectors of the economy whether that's agriculture whether that's waste management um energy system like we are infiltrating everything whether it's providing district heating to cities like in vancouver mint green is whether you know it's folks that are going on farms and collecting the poop and making biogas and mining bitcoin on it and supporting their agricultural operation 
landfills, they're grabbing the same thing, the methane, yeah. and it's reducing GHGs because methane is a more potent greenhouse gas. So I think as we infiltrate, it gets harder to stop because you bring along other stakeholders, you bring along the farmers, right? You bring along the oil and gas operators who are partnering with miners to reduce carbon emissions because typically it would be flared. And if you burn it more effectively, uh, when a miner comes in, they, they put a better yeah. system. So again, you've got the oil and gas sector behind you. Although it still seems like it's it's hard to bring the environmentalist yeah. along to understand, yeah. hey, we're actually doing what you want to see happen. And that's the most frustrating part because like I said, I spent a decade in low yeah. carbon economic transition and I saw, you know, we need trillions of dollars of investment to get to the goals where they're trying to get to and they're they're scared to put in very stringent measures because they want to get reelected again, right? Prices will go up and people will get angry, right? And so, um, you know, the, ta- the the targets shift it used to be like 2030. Now we're aiming for 2040, 50, now 60 for net neutral. And, you know, typically it's rate payers. So um, those that use the energy system to construct a low carbon kind of energy system or it's taxpayers, you know, taxpayer yeah. dollars goes towards, you um, investments in clean energy or or low carbon technologies and now we have this third pocket that's not drawing on the tax base or the rate base it's just this elegant set of market economics that is bitcoin that is subsidizing um the infrastructure being built because the miners come in right and they can locate wherever the sources of power are cheap they can help um, whether it's, this is in Texas or in Africa, help build out infrastructure because they are, um, you know, a, a a load. So they're going to be buying the power and they're buying it 24 seven. Like they want to be running, right? They're a customer of first resort. They want to be running. They're a customer of last resort too, where um, if know, they need, nobody if else they wants to, to cut buy. off. Yeah, they can, but otherwise yeah. they can soak up as much and, as they can send. Exactly. Yeah. And so we have these amazing stories, you know, Africa helping support the Virunga National Park and, and saving gorillas with conservation because it's it's providing funding to the park. Yeah. Um, but then we also have stories in Texas where it's miners co-locating with um, renewable plants and, and, and helping subsidize it or in other parts of the U.S. where, where they're co-locating now with nu- small nuclear plants. And so I think that's that's kind of the next phase that's really interesting is supporting public infrastructure and that includes landfills too and and you know so it's not just energy system like we are you know spreading out our little tendrils (laughs) and i think that's awesome it's crazy to me how little people on the environmental side often understand about the you know supposedly environmental friendly ways of producing energy whether it's solar and wind and the the trade-offs and the fact you know, that you need a base load and how mining can help with that. And yeah. so they're fighting all these projects yeah. that'll actually help what they're trying to see happen. Yeah. It's- and so so I used to brief ministers, right, on energy files. And I remember those decks were, because I worked in a few different ministries, economic development, environment. Those were the most complex, thickest decks that we ever made, like presentations, because it's such a complex system, the energy system. Yeah. And so... So you have to have not only an understanding of Bitcoin, which is just complex enough <laughs> to understand the energy system. And it's just, you know, it goes over their heads or they get it into their mind that, you no. Know, and, and and this I'm seeing from policymakers um, where they as soon as it's a miner that's using the energy, if, if you were to just plug something in, for example, for district heating where you're taking the energy and you're exuding heat, it's OK. But as soon as the miner gets involved, which is ridiculous because actually sub- yeah. subsidizing in a way, um, it's like, oh, this doesn't count. This is bad. It could That energy could have been used for other uses, even if it has an environmental benefit. And that to me is crazy. It's there's no other industry that when I worked with heavy industry that would get so I don't know, scrutinized, scrutinized on what, yeah. or, or just <laughs> it's un you know business unfriendly yeah. like even that's like, a bad use of electricity oh, well, it, christmas lights yeah. is a good use like but, it's it's weird but even like industries that are typically criticized whether that's gun manufacturing or tobacco they don't get the same scrutiny they're like oh well at least they're creating jobs right it's like oh my goodness yeah. this is horrible but it's like the use of energy it's so fundamental to you know humans like again it, you know parts of africa you can't 
you don't have light, everything stops when it gets dark, right? And so if we're building out and subsidizing a place where locals can kind of flourish, because now they, they don't have to go for four hours a day to get water. Yeah. They can get it pumped. And like, you can't say it's a bad form of energy use that they're raising themselves up. And I think that's... You can't divide no. human development and flourishing from energy consumption. Yes. They, they really go hand in hand. And yeah. so, you know, a lot of times it's easy for people who have everything they need and they're like, no, they should use less energy. You're like, yeah. So what I think, you know, El Salvador has this interesting opportunity where, where they're open, I think, to partnering with Bitcoiners. And I'm seeing, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners come here and they want to make investments. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they also participate in something like, you know, mining, helping subsidize energy infrastructure or other Bitcoin companies, you know, yeah. how, how they are helping. And, and so and I think we all kind of hold uh, El Salvador, you know, near and dear to our hearts because it was the first country to take that chance. And I think we want to see it succeed and we'll try to make it succeed um, and really want to work. And they seem to be very open to working with industry like where I live in British Columbia, Canada, I don't believe they even consulted with the industry. They put in a mining ban for the next two years. And it's like, well, it's not good policy. Like I worked on policy making, and you have to consult yeah. with your stakeholders. Include the stakeholders. Yes. Because how else are you going to know what are going to be the ripple impacts of, yeah. of those decisions? Yeah. Because in, for example, in in Kent, you know, in BC, there are for some the, some of the companies that are operating there. You know, they're partnering with First Nations. They're helping First Nations communities typically, you know, the most disadvantaged. And it's like there are negative impacts. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. So so. Delve into a little bit about the generating um, energy and then thus mining from from trash and garbage. <laughs> yes. And, and yes. because I'm, I'm really fascinated by that because I've been contacted by probably 10 different firms over yeah. the last couple months about wanting to bring projects into El Salvador. We actually connected one of the companies with the Bitcoin Lake project that's happening awesome. uh, in Guatemala. But I'm always I'm kind of a skeptic by nature, and so I'm always <laughs> it's a good like, place to be. Yeah. Okay, if if this really works and it can generate and do all these things, yeah. like why isn't it happening in more places? Yeah. Like why yeah. would it work in El Salvador and not somewhere else? So yeah. so explain ah. to me the economics sure. of it and what you see for the potential in El Salvador. Sure. So uh, the company I advise is called PRTI, and what we do is we take waste tires. And we thermal. So you just work with tires. That's the just tires. Okay. But we're we're fundraising. So the next round, we will allocate some funds to R and D to look into things like plastics, because you know tires, plastics, they all come from you know originally oil, yeah, yeah. Uh, petroleum based, and so so there is potential. But we've been mining Bitcoin since 2016 um, in the U.S. using tires, and you know not slow and not loud about it because we want to make sure we get the process, you know, down like fully replicable. And we've done that. Um, and so we take the tires, but we don't crush them or do anything with them because that's costly. It requires yeah. manual labor, it requires additional energy. So they go into a vertical reactor and they get a little bit of natural gas to start the process. But once it gets going, because you know, tires, yeah, tires are, are, are very flammable. Exactly. Well, it, but they're not burned. They're thermally deconstructed. So okay. it's kind of like a, cooking type of process where things it's think of it as so like a not, vertical refinery but so they're not actually they're on not fire no they're, so they're, that's another misconception okay. right and so you ask one of you know what are some of the challenges nimbyism has been a challenge historically yeah. for energy recovery the fourth r right recycle reuse reduce um recover is but people are like oh, we're not lab rats don't burn yeah. tires or other waste around us so some jurisdictions they don't like to have anything to do that looks like burning or, or you know use or like burning because they're yeah. scared of emissions but also emissions technology has come quite a long way not not necessarily just ghd emissions there's other emissions that get captured but i digress so so does the 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 gas provide all the heating or does is the there a reaction starts, within the, starts the process okay. and then it continues so i think of it as a kind of like a vertical refinery where just in a regular refinery different parts come off you know they extract natural gas they extract um coal coke at the bottom but there's also oil and there's different grades of things so it's a very similar process where we extract from the tires after 11 hours you get oil 
that can be burned in some diesel generators. So they get you know pulled out um, and filtered. There is a synthetic gas like natural gas. There is um, this black carbon, carbon kind of product that uh, we currently sell to another company as BTU content like coal. Um, and the okay. fourth thing is scrap steel because 25% of a tire is steel. So you can thing. sell it for scrap. Yeah. So these are four byproducts that come off of it that all have some value um, that could be sold. But the best part is that we actually get paid to take the tires because typically you know, in North America, when you're throwing out waste, you pay a tipping fee because the landfill needs money to, whether it's operate currently yeah. or when it's um, closed off, there's still some operating kind of costs there. So you have to fund for that. And so we get paid for it. And we also... And what what is the, for an average, you know, car tire, what is the, the fee that you guys get paid? Now? It does vary by state. So, and it's per ton kind yeah. of... Oh, I can't remember at the moment, but we do, we do get, four, I do, in terms of stats, we get four, um, sorry, three gallons of oil per tire. Okay. Um, so it's, it's quite a lot. Um, but anyways, I think, so everybody tends to focus on the carbon aspect, right? Like Bitcoin can help mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, for example, from landfills. Right. But I think it's also exciting. Like this is a different type of environmental problem that Bitcoin is coming in to help. With because if you look at tires, you know, they're vulcanized, they're supposed to like take a beating on the road, right? They're hard, but then like, what do you do after it? And some landfills are, are making it illegal to accept tires because there's leaching, like um, toxic toxics leach into the ground. Um, tires were historically used for playgrounds or for soccer fields, but they're becoming illegal in like the US, um, in, in some states in the US, in Europe, because they're finding that typically they would grind them up and then, so there's more surface area and there's toxin um, air emissions being released and, you know, uh, kids breathing it, it's not it's not good. So again, like, so what do we do with these tires? Yeah. It used to be used, you know, landfilled or it used to be put on these playgrounds and we don't really have a use for it anymore. So here's a solution to also, not just a waste problem, but an energy security problem, because think of all the the landfills that have tires um or just you know like there's a tire thrown up for every person in the u.s a year a billion tires around the world and i think it's really interesting too because you can set up these um modular reactors they're not like a giant generating station so you can create a more decentralized type yeah. of system and for island nations where you know energy they don't have great sources of energy maybe it's hawaii or puerto rico Right. You're not blessed like <laughs> the um, the Middle East with yeah, oil, for yeah. example. It's I mean, even El Salvador, El Salvador has yeah. historically gotten a lot of their energy from from diesel, mm -hmm. which is a very expensive way to produce energy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a different type of operation yeah. where you do get paid for your energy use, but you do have to build additional infrastructure because you're, you're an energy company, yeah. right? You're a technology company. So you're building out those vertical. So, so which elements of those are you then turning into energy and which ones are you selling off it and that's kind of like there's an optionality yeah. so during a bear market right at some point it maybe makes more sense to sell and it depends and, and again if you're in a high energy price jurisdiction maybe you do want to generate uh, power and just sell it to the grid or, or sell the oil um Perhaps, you know, with some. And is there a market for that oil? I'm assuming it's not something you can just well, you can put in your diesel pickup truck. Uh, it, it's certain types of diesel yeah. generators that will accept okay. it, but but you can sell it. Uh, or, I mean, again, it's I mean, what, what is your guys model? Are you burning that diesel engine in the generators? Yes, to my Are you Bitcoin. burning the gas yeah. also? Yeah. Is it multi fuel that yeah. you're. Yeah. Okay. But then the, the black carbon gets sold off to another. Okay. Um, the manufacturer that's using it and so we're, we're build it, build, building a second site with 16 reactors next and again the intent is to mine bitcoin but in some places it might be um there might be like i said a different interest right and so so i think it's the fact that again a totally different environmental problem and we're building out it you could help fund public infrastructure like just an energy generation and you don't even have to mine bitcoin you could run any data yeah. center off of that right um i think is 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 an interesting thing to i mean bitcoin is nice just because 
with the miners, you can whenever the there's not other demand for the electricity, you you can always yeah. turn the miners on. So obviously that optionality is is a benefit. But I'm yeah. thinking even for in a place like El Salvador, where you know there are lots of places in the country where electricity is is, is expensive. I mean, my yeah. I'd be embarrassed to, to say how much my electric bill is because it's, it's more than the average person in El Salvador makes yeah, in, in a month. So it's it's expensive here to use electricity. So I could see yeah. Things like this that yeah. are sometimes used for for mining, but other times just feeding into the grid and, and providing better run, run, energy yeah. use for the people. Run so. regular data yeah. centers, for example, like Google and whatnot. And, um, and, you know, there are certain companies that maybe they have a fleet of tires because they have a lot of trucks yeah. and it makes sense to set something up. So there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of optionality. So what, what would, I'm just curious is, yeah. you know, being here in El Salvador, would you guys look at it as I'm getting these this interest from these other companies uh, that are coming in? Like, do you see like, yeah, there would be potential to have a real money making business. El Salvador is a very small, densely populated yeah. country. So having managing waste is a big issue. They do generate a lot of tires. And so is there other factors that would keep this from being a viable place to, to operate? So typically, um so the next site that we're setting up is one. So you need a supply of tires. So you need about um, 2.4 uh, million tires a year for, for the next site that we're building in, in Virginia, which is about eight megawatts, um, 75 million for the, for the infrastructure costs. So you need a few different factors, but the rate at which you can build the site depends on permitting. So some jurisdictions are maybe less business friendly. Yeah. You have to really, it takes a long time to work through because you're working with waste, right? It takes a long time to get the appropriate permits. Um, and so that could be something that hinders whether you set up there, right? But if it was a government like El Salvador's that's, that's very business friendly and they said, hey, we want to see this yeah. happen, would that be more encouraging for be, companies to, to come in and certainly so again you have to kind of look at the economics yeah. and and so we're focused on the u.s where initially a few sites where um so we have one we're building a second and the next set of sites will be in those jurisdictions that are easier to get permits um that have the supply maybe they're near tire manufacturers the other thing that i didn't mention is like 10 percent of tires that are manufactured just get thrown out because they're off spec and so when I visited the the site, um, uh, like the existing site, I, I happened to look at all the tires that they had because it's kind of like a just in time system yeah. where they get brought in and they put in the reactors. Almost all of them were brand new, and it's kind of a shock that because you you know you're like oh waste tires I understand, yeah. but no, there's a lot of waste that comes off the line. So you know maybe you're located closer to a tire manufacturing facility. Um, or or a landfill that has tires. So the, these are the considerations because transport costs can be expensive yeah. too. So you want to make sure you're near that base. So that's something that we would look at. But I mean, we have looked at there's about 800 sites that we could b build worldwide. So so I mean, if the, certainly open to exploring opportunities <laughs> beyond the U.S. Yeah, no, I, I would think in higher. I mean, because in general, the, the U.S. has pretty low energy costs compared to yes. the, the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, where in, in countries like El Salvador, I mean, I, I understand some of the mining that they're doing right at the side of the volcanoes, maybe their energy costs can be competitive, but in general, yeah. energy costs are, are pretty high here. So it would almost seem like it would make more sense to, like you were saying, island nations or things like that, yeah, where they're where paying you, crazy amounts of money to, to generate electricity. And where you don't have, you know, a, an easy access to fuel, like for example, you know, maybe certain countries are shipping in tons of fuel and they're expensive, right? So, you know, looking at alternatives, yeah. I think does make sense. Um, and, I, and I have heard, you know, geothermal it can be effective, but it is costly. So, right, there's it, there's yeah. always like yeah. pros and cons and... and <laughs> no, I would love to see complex, more, yeah. you know, like a variety of, of companies coming in to El Salvador yeah. and, and making those kind of... A, you know, investments that yeah. give them a better mix of energy, but also make it more environmental friendly and obviously bring the cost down because I think that's that's one aspect that's holding industry yeah. in El Salvador back is is the electricity cost is, is okay. fairly high. Yeah. Is and there, I've heard that from a number of companies. They said yeah. and employees are great, like it's a very productive employee base. The the business environment's great, but some of the electricity costs are kind of high. So that's one of yeah. the, the downsides. And that is the challenge when I worked with my industries in Canada. 
right? Because our infrastructure was so old and there were decades of underinvestment, they suddenly had to catch up because we had rolling blackouts and brownouts. And plus the renewables were coming online. We phased out coal. We did have nuclear in Ontario at least. Um, but, you know, industries like our bills are really going up. Like, my, and plus the carbon yeah. costs now you're adding to, like, it, we're struggling to stay here. And if we're going to make investments, maybe we don't, you know, refurbish that steel plant, you know, get a new Coke oven. Maybe we just put that investment into Brazil or another place where it's a cheaper jurisdiction to work in. Or maybe we don't open a whole new site. We wanted to, but not anymore. Yeah. And so these are important decisions, but also having that business certainty, right? Having that certainty that, you know, the government isn't going to change the rules on you, that it is, you know, stable, that no one's going to confiscate your equipment. Because, yeah. you know, sometimes some countries, it's risky to operate in it. Whether they changed the electricity prices, they added taxes like in Kazakhstan, um, or um, you know they might actually just take. Oh, now, now it's nationalized. Yeah. It'd be a Venezuela <laughs> situation where they just yeah. start grabbing things. Yeah. Huh. Well, I would love to delve deeper in this, but I'm going to get in trouble with Stacy because I promised <laughs> I'd have you uh, back for her birthday dinner. I know. Um, I'm so excited. But I'm sure it sounds like you're going to be back to El Salvador. I hope so. Um, <laughs> and hopefully you bring some and you know potential <laughs> investments with you. I, I really do think that for people in the energy sector, I think there's a lot of yeah. potential here because I think the economy is really starting to boom and that's going to be something that they need for people yeah. to bring innovative solutions in. So I'd love to see more of these um you know, things, people thinking outside the box that are bringing in different ways to, to meet that need. And, so. and I th last point, I think it's really awesome and exciting how Bitcoin City is being kind of thought from the ground up because typically, you know, cities get added on here and there and then you but you, like, you, you actually can plan yeah. the city, you can plan how the energy system works. And, and that's pretty special. It's something that you can work with different industries and, and stakeholders to, to make it succeed. No, I think I, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of a skeptic. And so, I, you know, big projects like that, yeah. they, they have yeah. a pretty mixed history worldwide. Yeah. And so, um, but I, I'm definitely, if any government can pull it off, <laughs> I think it's this government. Yeah. I mean, they really, when they set their mind something, they, they really follow through with it. So, so. let's look back in 10 yeah. years. <laughs> Where uh, can people find you? Yep. Um, and what projects, is there anything that you want to make sure people know about or yeah, anything you want to shill here at the end? Um, no, I think so. Um, you can find me on Twitter at crypto underscore Megs, uh, legacy name, but I think we, you know, the crypto pulls others <laughs> in, into the Bitcoin. Um, I'm on Nostra too. And I have that in my Twitter profile. Like it's such a great community there. It's a totally different vibe. Um, shilling. I mean, I, I got to talk about some of the important things to me, yeah. but also I want to show El Salvador. I think, um, you know, it's it's a great place to visit. Uh, it's very welcoming and there's just so many cool things that you can do here. No, it sounds like in a week you hit a good <laughs> chunk, but next time you have to take a few months and you yeah. can see the rest of the country. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much for uh, for spending the evening and your last evening in El Salvador. So. Thanks for uh, hopefully we'll on. we'll see you here again in a few months and yeah. we'll we'll get an update. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Megs. <laughs>